programmed at 8.30. My name is Bert Barnett. I'm one of the park rangers out here. And a lot of what we know from Civil War history comes to us from written accounts. The accounts left to us by veterans who wrote down their experiences on the battlefield. A lot of what the uh, detailed students are familiar with are the accounts of those uh, first line participants, most famously the official records of the War of the Rebellion. How many of you folks are familiar with that? Big 52 volume series one, you know, all uh, the reports, uh, memos, all that sort of stuff, uh, nicely organized and uh, footnoted and indexed, all that sort of stuff. Well, of course, anytime you have a major event of that sort of thing, you're also going to have the uh, smaller, lesser sorts of accounts that are written that will appear in periodicals and papers and smaller books. Uh, and of course, in the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s, you will even have the emergence of a paperback trade uh, that's already started but is beginning to metastasize in a great many ways uh, for that. One of the fellows who's going to come to the fore in that regard, some folks are better writers and storytellers than others, and the fellow that I'm going to introduce you to this evening is a fellow by the name of Augustus Buell, therefore the title of the program this evening. A very interesting fellow, but he writes very well. Sometimes if you're not gifted uh, with the possession of the truth, the ability to tell a good story will not stand in the way of presenting an attractive case. And this is going to be the case for Augustus Buell. Want to uh, get into that. The book that you see here is actually published in 1890 in book form by the National Tribune Company of Washington, D.C. The way many students become familiar with Augustus Caesar Buell. For many years, this work will be seen as a classic example of frontline artillery diary from the Civil War, packed with battery rosters, maps, powerful accounts of famous battles, bolstered by the corresponding testimonies of supporting witnesses. This detailed work seems to have it all until the story behind it is revealed. However, the very power of the work spawned a phenomenon known as the fruit of the poisonous tree. Here's example number one. And this particular fellow, uh, Henry Steele Commenter, widely regarded as a tremendous Civil War historian, uh, will not shrink from picking up some of Augustus Buell's work. There is no better account of the first day's fighting than of the cannoneer. And to give you an idea of why he's inspired to say that, a sample of Buell's writing is thus. No one now living will ever again see those two brigades of Wadworth's division, Cutler's and the Iron Brigade, file by as they did that morning. The little creek made a depression in the road with a gentle ascent on either side, so that from our point of view, the column, as it came down one slope and up the other, had the effect of huge blue billows of men toppled with a spray of shining steel, and the whole spectacle was calculated to give nerve to men who had none before. That's a pretty descriptive visual image that draws you in literally to the morning of the 1st of July as the battle is opening on the ridges west of the town of Gettysburg. But he won't be the first. Chapter 3 of The Guns at Gettysburg, which is a specifically artillery-oriented book, Chapter 3, The First Day of Gettysburg, talking about the nature of the artillery fight out west of town. The guns became very things of life, not implements, but comrades. Every man was doing the work of two or three. At our gun, at the finish, there was only the corporal, number one, and number three, with two drivers fetching ammunition. The water in Pat's bucket was like ink. His face and hands were smeared all over with burnt powder. The thumb stall of number three was burned to a crisp by the hot vent field. You begin to get a flavor that this guy can really write. And this is what's going to draw folks in. Now, the fellow who writes the account of the artillery from the primarily Union point of view, L. Van Loon Naswald in the 60s, will take it on a slightly more personal level, from, or take a more slightly personal 
uh, section of the account that you will write. If we are whipped here and I pull through it alive, I'm going to make tracks for home, and the provost guard may be damned. Not just Gettysburg, but also a little later on in the 1864 campaign at the Wilderness. Some of the artillery pieces were not as uh, well thought of as other artillery pieces, and one of them was called the Parrot Rifle. The iron guns that you'll see on the battlefield with a belt of metal at the back of them. That's because they were made of cast iron and they needed that wrought iron belt at the back of them to keep them from exploding. They were basically the Saturday night specials of the uh, Union Artillery Service and justly disregarded by the uh, artillerist. And Buell would write about it this way. Read the disposition of the parrot rifles. One old regular gunner expressed the Army's opinion, if anything could justify desertions by a cannoneer, it would be an assignment to a parrot battery, page 142 in the cannoneer. Now these are old books, but in the daylight of modern scholarship, Bradley Gottfried's book in 2008, you still see him citing that writing describing a fight along the Chambersburg Road. Up and down the line, the men reeling and falling, splinters flying from the wheels and axles where bullets hit in the rear, you get the idea. All of this is a reflection on the tremendous writing skill that our author had. Part of what made Buell's work so compelling was that almost irresistible combination of the captivating storyline presented with unquestionable power. But it didn't start out as a book to draw those other folks to utilize the material in it in their later works on the artillery in the Battle of Gettysburg. It would start out as a column in the National Tribune, the Union Soldiers Veteran Paper. What was, de what was destined to become the cannoneer began as a series of 26 columns in the Tribune that ran between October of 1889 and April of 1890. In them, he intros his service record with the 4th U.S. Regular Artillery Battery B. It began modestly enough on the ninth day of September 1862 and concludes on the 31st day of August 1865 when I was discharged from the service of the United States by reason of Special Order 191, Department of Texas, Brownsville. This detailed material appeared only in the column and did not appear in his subsequent book. So let's take a closer look at this author. Actually, it turns out Augustus Caesar Buell was not a cannoneer at all. From the Losters and Fisters, he was the uh, New York fellow that uh, tracked down all the uh, listings for New York soldiers. Age 18 years, enlisted, August 21, 1863, at Norwich, New York, mustered in as a private in the 20th New York Cavalry Company L, September 22nd, 1863, to serve three years, appointed corporal, November, unknown, 1863, reduced to the ranks, April 30th, 1864, mustered out with company, July 31, 1865, near Manchester, Virginia. So while he writes tremendously about being this artillerist in this famous battery <laughs> he's not and take good notes of the image that you see here of him notice the long boots and notice the 1860 cavalry saber who wears those certainly not an artillerist a cavalryman so if that is to be believed as him and he's got it in there as the image from the let's see if i can find my red whoops okay <laughs> i killed my slides i'm never good with these things uh but if you see what it says here that's a credit taken right out of the cannoneer book page 156 so he credits that uh or i credit because that was taken out of the book uh so uh that is what he used as his own image, perhaps a little bit of mea culpa there. 
but Company L of the 20th New York Cavalry served mostly in eastern Virginia and the Carolinas, most notably at Darby Town Road and in the fall of Petersburg. And since he enlists well after the Battle of Gettysburg, where does he get these great details? Where does he come up with this stuff, as they would say? <coughs> well, of course, like any other veteran, he will cross paths post-war with other veterans. And he does so at Cramp Shipyard, Philadelphia, where Augustus Buell becomes the cannoneer. Buell had the luck there to cross paths with a Battery B vet, Charles Henry Moore, who had served with the unit from 1856 through the end of the war in 1865. Moore dies in 1896. He came to know Buell while working as a fitter in Cramp Shipyard during the mid to late 1880s. Moore was most likely Buell's artillery tutor and the source of much of his information. But not all of it, for as every writer learns, as soon as your words see daylight, the critics come in. And this is going to happen to Buell as well. But remember, it doesn't start out as the book, it starts out in the column form in the veteran newspaper. Notice this, the highlighted section in the uh, little commentary here. I should also like the writer to explain, here's a, here's a critical letter to Buell about what he has written. I should like the writer to explain how he managed to do this without the number four as he was the most essential man in the action as he pulled the lanyard you know going into that he's correct he did it without mentioning the number four will Buell as an old cavalryman doesn't know anything about the number four and so he will take this sort of thing and then when the uh, rebuttal on that comes you will get the uh, next segment of Buell's column addressing that. I here furnish you with more additional information you know, and so he'll take that, adjust that depending on what the real veterans say and oh by the way I failed to mention this and here we go with that. But even in his later bound version of the cannoneer, Buell seemed to have trouble with details. Note the number of gunners around the tube in this illustration of the Gettysburg battle scene. But some of this he learns through people like uh, Comrade Knight, or Veteran Knight, I should say. He will also get uh, a very important recognition, un un uh, looked for, but very important recognition in the figure of one particular fellow. And this will be Captain Stewart the captain of the battery. Captain Stewart helped November 21st, 1899. In an article entitled, The Old Man Comes to the Front, Stewart, in response to a letter written to him by Buell, responds firstly to Buell, your request to obtain photographs of Lieutenant Davidson, one of the uh, officers in the, well, a couple of officers in the, in, the, in the unit. Lieutenant Davidson, Mitchell, and Goodman received. I am sorry to say it is out of my power as Mitchell and Goodman are dead, I have no idea where any of their friends live. The sketch you are publishing brings to mind many vivid incidents mentioned, and I certainly endorse most everything that a writer has said, with the exception that concerning myself. The men were the best class of men that I ever saw in the military service, both for intelligence and military pride, and I certainly <coughs> concur with the writer's statement as regards the bravery of the men while in battle. Two lines above that section, I said, I feel sure you could obtain the accurate roles of the battery at any time you may desire by sending to the adjutant general in Washington. And this is very interesting because that's very true. He could have just written to the archives, but obviously he never did that. Because what would be or not be in that role at the archives? Rosters. I'm sorry? Rosters. Rosters. And if he's not on that roster, what would somebody else likely discover? That fact. 
I'm sorry? That he didn't participate. That he did not participate. Now, uh, if you go out on the western portion of the battlefield, uh, near where Lee's headquarters is, you will see this scenario out here where the battery monument is, right here, the regular battery monument and the uh, half battery. There'd be three guns, but there's two, given the fact the way the War Department puts out uh, artillery pieces to uh, indicate a monument, a uh, battery position. And When he writes of uh, what takes place on the uh, afternoon of the 1st, he gives a pretty good description of the way things go. And this is what makes the accounting so fascinating about all of this. Because he has talked to folks who were actually there, he's able to draw all of this material in. All he has to do is just throw a few uh, out of the uh, position pronouns out there and make it seem like he was actually there. Ordnance Sergeant Mitchell jumped on our uh, wheel to help us. This is tough work, boys, he shouted as he wheeled a gun around, but we are good for it. And Pat Wallace, tugging at the near wheel, shouted back, If we ain't, where'll you find them that is? Well, this change of front gave us a clean rake along the rebel line for a whole brigade length, but it exposed our right flank to the raking volleys of their infantry near the pike, who at that moment began to get up again and come on. They gave us volley after volley in front and flank, and we gave them double canister as fast as we could. The 6th Wisconsin and the 11th Pennsylvania men crawled up over the bank of the cut and behind the rail fence near Stewart's caissons and joined their musketry to our canister, while from the north side of the cut flashed the chain lightning of the old man's half battery in solid street. You know, talking about the fighting that takes place there. And of course, when he does this, of course, this is going into the veterans <coughs> newspaper, and I'm going to hit the light right here. There we go. So he's going to be bringing in vulnerability, you would think, for people, but because he is so correct with the information that he's getting, he's able to bring the legitimacy of other voices who say, yeah, I remember that, or I remember this, and all of these folks uh, begin to really jump on this, and nobody really questions whether he was there or not. Other correspondents would praise Buell's column. On November the 5th, 1889, General Rufus Dawes, former commander of the 6th Wisconsin Infantry, wrote, I want to thank you for putting on the record the fact that I formed a line of battle across a street in Gettysburg. This line was the cover of your retreat. We had a hot skirmish right there, but we held the street. But Dawes did not praise unquestioningly. He went on in his letter. My official report says, Four guns of Stewart's battery were in the timber on the right of the railroad cut. You say three, and it is likely you were correct. And then it goes emphasis in the letter. Although my report was written on, Jan on July 17, 1863, I was ordered to support the battery. And until your statement, I had it in my mind that four were only there. Dennis M. Fuller worked on the number two gun and I got a letter sent to your publication saying that gun was on the Cashtown Turnpike. General Scales of North Carolina and I went over this ground together in 1882. Your battery almost destroyed his brigade, as indeed it did. Now, of course, the problem when they threw their battery over to the side, as you can perhaps make out here what he's talking about, is when he threw those guns over to the side of the road here is as the infantry came by, uh, they definitely would be able to uh, hit the Confederates in the flank as, the, as they came through, uh, right through there. And he will go on to describe exactly what uh, the vulnerability was. Take cover of the wheel when this desperate work began. I had stood close in the gun, thumbing the vent, which is what you need to do to close the back end of the barrel while you're sponging it out, lest they actually see another round of ammunition on top of a hot spark, and that's not good for the guy shoving around down the, down the barrel. 
standing bolt upright according to the letter of the manual. And these are all great technical bits that everybody who's ever worked an artillery piece way out there reading this as a veteran newspaper would immediately identify with. Now remember, this guy's never fired a cannon in his life. He's been a cavalryman. But this is all good stuff that he got from his veteran friends in the shipyard. According to the letter of the manual, arching my left thumb and resting my fingers on the gun, about our third load, a bullet from the enemy behind the fence on our flank and tore through the breast of my jacket, making the cloth fly and carrying away the second button from the top. Packard, who had his hands on the screw at the moment, the elevating screw at the back of the barrel, in the act of letting her muzzle down a little, noticed this and called out, stretch out your arm, Cub, and get the, cover, get the wheel. The wheel of the 12-pound Napoleon with its deep fellows and huge spokes affords considerable cover for the number three against either a flanking fire. My breast had a red welt on it and was sore for several days. So this is the account that he puts out there. Now today, we would call that perhaps stolen valor, except for the fact that, you know, in this period of time, people think a little bit differently about that. But by this time, there are enough folks out there that actually served with the battery that are beginning to wonder, hey, I don't remember this guy, and they will begin to uh, write about this. One fellow writes, I think the author is or was a Western man or boy. I was with him at Gettysburg. Another fellow, you know, said, I would like his address now so as to write to him, not only as a comrade and to revive all, asso all associations, but also for a suggestion or two. And the editor who wants to keep this going, I think it's a grand thing because it's getting so much feedback and helping to fill the paper. It is our intention to let this sketch go on in public and its historical merits alone, independent of the identity of the author, though several veterans of the battery have already traced out the authorship to their own satisfaction through internal <coughs> references familiar to them. Now, it's also interesting because the folks that publish the paper also publish other things, and they're already thinking about the possibilities of a book. Now, one of the things that they will do whenever one of these veterans will uh, give a little bit more information to uh, Buell here, he will hold on to those little bits. Good material from Tribune readers frequently was recycled into the book. This notation here on old brick top for one of the brigade commanders will be uh, utilized into the book. Comrade J.R. McClure of the 14th Indiana says, he knows what he was talking about, gives us straight goods. I am glad General Carroll, which is the regimental uh, commander, the brigade commander he was talking about, uh, gets credit for what he did. I think General Carroll was the most abused man in this army, but when there was any quick and, whenever there was any quick or bloody fighting to be done, Carroll and his regiment were called upon to do it. The boys used to call him Old Bricktop on account of that red head. He would even go so far as to have fraudulent image credits. So there's nothing that they're not doing in the media at that point that they're not doing in the media now. Just as the momentum of the storyline continued to develop, veterans of the battery occasionally appeared to contribute material. The unquestioned inference, of course, was that Buell served in the battery alongside these men. Now, where would he be able to come up with a picture like this if he wasn't there? But Buell is not the only dubious author in this period of time. Theodore Garrish of the 20th Maine is doing the same thing, and he will fight the Battle of Gettysburg from Philadelphia. He wrote his book, A Private's Reminiscences of the Civil War in 1883, though he was absent from the 20th Maine, sick in the U.S. General Hospital from June the 9th in uh, Philadelphia, and did not return until September that he didn't state he was there and didn't announce his absence either. And this is his passage on what happens at Little Round Top. You, take, you, you can be the judge on this. How can I describe the scene? Imagine, if you will, small companies of infantry put there to hold the key of the entire position against at least 10 times their number. The conflict opens. I know not who gave the first fire or who received the first lead. 
I wish that I could picture with my pen the awful details of that hour. How rapidly the cartridges were torn from the boxes and stuffed into the smoking muzzles of the guns. How the steel rammers clashed and clanged in the heated barrels. How the men's hands and faces grew grim and black. A terrible medley of cries, shouts, cheers, groans, prayers, curses, bursting shells, whizzing rifle bullets, and clanging steel. And if that was all, my heart would not be so sad and heavy as I write. Did you get the impression he was there? <laughs> but of course he wasn't. Fourteen years later, in 1897, Colonel Joshua Chamberlain asked a trusted Gettysburg veteran of the 20th, Albert Fernald of Company K, to double check Garrish's little round top participation. Fernald confirmed that Garrish had not been present at Gettysburg, yet curiously his name appears on the muster of Company H on page 268 of Maine at Gettysburg as submitted by Chamberlain. Now some say he just didn't get the clarification on that before Chamberlain sent it in, but we're not sure on that. Now, that gives you an idea of Buell at the Battle of Gettysburg. But another load of Buell is out there in the historic text. John Paul Jones, founder of the American Navy. This comes out in 1900. And if you thought uh, you know, his artillery story at Gettysburg or something, you ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> Buell's biography of American naval hero Admiral John Paul Jones appears in 1900 and makes waves for many years. Initially heralded as a great body of research, Buell's work left its landmarks along the way. This is the historic John Paul Jones house in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. One of them was this, one of those landmarks was this, this historic John Paul Jones house where Jones actually lived for a time in Portsmouth, New Hampshire during the mid and latter 1770s. As Buell's story goes, a group of Portsmouth women led by one recently married, Helen Seavey, tore up their finest gowns to patch together an American flag for Jones's use during the Revolutionary War as he harassed British shipping off the coast of Europe while captain of the Ranger, the famous Revolutionary War story. But it never happened. The story was a Buell invention, <laughs> yet to this day there is a historical plaque based partly on Buell's imaginative research and the Jones legacy, later Buell's fantastic quilting party story, quite possibly saved this house. <laughs> Helen Seavey, like so much else, was a fiction of his imagination. And this will have uh, its impact down, later on down the line of uh, John Paul Jones. Uh, uh, cultural impact because when they decide to, when they actually find him, there's a woman by the name of Helen DeCoven who is a rich socialite uh, who has taken it upon herself to really be the uh, ultimate in John Paul Jones historiography around the time of the turn of the century. And when uh, Jones is found and exhumed, and you'll notice the difference between, notice the parallel rather, between the, uh, the sculpted face and what actually comes out of the ground. Uh, she is really after getting the truth about all of this. She is, in essence, a rich grave digger. Paul Jones is Miss Jacobin's hero. She cares a good deal that the things said about him uh, should be correct and genuine. She had earlier criticized Buell uh, and his work. Now, this is uh, a commentary that comes out uh, the New York Times, June the 10th, 1906, uh, when his, after his book comes out. Based upon a bare thread of truth, says Mr. Coven, after many months of critical investigation, it is padded with inventions of clever construction and of unparalleled audacity. So he's really, he really fires back at uh, what he writes. But he is a tremendously creative researcher. All sorts of stories and things like that. And one of the things that this does in the American historical community is, you know, get people cranked up. I'm going to correct all of those mistakes. 
and one of the great naval historians of the time period is this fellow, Samuel Elliot Morrison. And Sally, uh, Samuel Elliot Morrison uh, decides that he's going to see what he can do about adjusting all of this. Noted for his works on maritime history and American history that were both authoritative and highly popular, one of his works uh, will be on John Paul Jones' A Sailor's Biography, which comes out in 1959. It, won, it, win him, it wins him a second Pulitzer. Initially, he vowed to overturn every one of Jules' lies, but found the task so overwhelming that he gave up and merely proceeded with his own research. Of Jules' work, he would later write, he found it easier to write, uh, to, to write Jones' letters himself than to use the genuine ones in the Library of Congress, which he never visited. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he, he knows just exactly what he's up against with Buell and decides, you know, forget this, I'm just going to do my own. As a result, uh, Buell's prodigious myth-making in this area, uh, Buell, not Jones, is now thought to be the literal originator of the famous quote, hold on to your hat here, I have not yet begun to fight. Yeah. Another highly esteemed piece of writing associated with Jones uh, after many years is the qualifications of a naval officer, which bears Buell's questionable stamp, compiled by uh, Augustus C. Buell from letters written by John Paul Jones. It is widely seen, uh, reproduced in many places, even appearing in naval circles and websites. The following example was taken directly from the USNA website now, the last time I updated this was 2017. Uh, I hadn't gotten to my computer yet, but uh, I think it's probably still there because it's been there for many years. But you can see the last line right there on the bottom there, compiled by Augustus C. Buell from letters written by uh, John Paul Jones. Uh, so when you go home, check out, check out the USNA website and see if it's still there or if they've redeemed themselves. So... That's uh, one of the things that he worked on. But he is not done yet, uh, because this man will blaze his way through history like Sherman goes through South Carolina. This is uh, a rather interesting uh, writer or uh, author of fictitious histories. He will now set his sights on Andrew Jackson. <laughs> the History of Andrew Jackson, Pioneer Patriot, Soldier Politician, President, 1904. It, pu it is published the year that Buell dies. By the time of Robert Remini's 1977 scholarly study of Jackson in 1977, one scholar noted of uh, Buell's work in this area, there is a strong probability that what cannot be documented in Buell's work from other sources is legendary, garbled, or fiction. Another Jackson biography was suspicious of Buell as a source, yet cited him 33 times. <laughs> Even Remini, with hesitation, does likewise, citing the old story that Aunt Betty Jackson, upon seeing the five-year-old Andrew Jackson crying, commanded, Stop that, Andrew. Don't let me see you cry again. Girls were made to cry, not boys. Well then, mother, the young Andrew replied, what are boys made for? To fight, she snapped. So, again, you get a flavor of uh, Jackson and what he does. So, or uh, Buell, rather, and what he does. So this is kind of a legacy that Buell has left, not only with his writings on Civil War, but also the way he writes uh, history slash historical fiction. A very interesting character. Now, at this point, I wanted to bring in somebody else a little more modern that writes historical fiction, that rather odd title that we've seen ascribed to various other books. So I decided to talk to uh, the one remaining Shahara, uh, the uh, son of a fellow that we know from the author of The Killer Angels. And Jeff Shahara said this about historical fiction. He said, certainly anyone writing fiction should be honest about it. The risk, as has sometimes happened with my book, is that someone will quote a line of my dialogue as though it is, in, as though it is fact, when it is a product of my own imagination. So I try painstakingly to be true to the characters, to put words in their mouths that ring true. At the end of the day, it's still fiction. 
As you know, neither my father nor I have ever tried to pass off our work as the fact. When I began to hear that my book and his were being used in schools to teach history, that only added to the responsibility I feel to get it right. The critique of our work as being bogus history, the astounding amount of nitpicking over the facts is patently ridiculous. So in other words, if it is done well, historical fiction become, can become a gateway drug of sorts, prompting folks to become interested in the real history. But that's not what Buell did. And of course, Buell, like I said, would not be the last one of these that does that sort of thing. You will have more famous examples of it. But these folks oftentimes research the role very heavily. Peggy Mitchell, known as Margaret Mitchell, perhaps better, uh, spent some time researching the roles of the characters in her famous novel. Uh, here's a letter to Lola, one of her uh, friends, discussing some of that research. December 1, 1935, about the war and reconstruction women writers were discussing. I have clawed, I have clawed my memory to some activity, and I think it was... I think one book was The Wartime Diary of a Georgia Girl, which is a very interesting historical book by Eliza Frances Andrews. Another was A Woman's Wartime Journal by Dolly Sumner Lunt, Mrs. Thomas Berger. A third was Life in Dixie During the War by Mary Gay. I have read so much of this period during the last year that I cannot exactly remember whether those writers lived in Fulton or DeKalb counties or in more distant places. Mitchell like the Sharas, engaged a historical setting to spin a false story, yet they never claimed their constructions were intended to be taken as true history. Given the setting of the times, however, sometimes circumstances fall beyond an author's control. And here we get into the really weird with this sort of stuff. The strange death of Ashley Wilkes in World War II. However, the merging of history Fate and fiction can, on rare occasions, under controlled circumstances, provide a limited benefit, as in 1933. The obituary of Leslie Howard, famed British stage and film star, is announced. Now, that's because he was being used for a role that he had perhaps uh, not really signed on for. He was doing uh, British OSS stuff, uh, going out and doing that sort of thing. Uh, but his death, although they would announce it without the OSS sort of connections, uh, provided the time to announce the death of a regular British serviceman as far as they would announce it in the public. And that was this fellow here, uh, turned fiction to reality, the man who never was, for an extremely specified purpose. Acting Major William Martin, the man who never was, resulted from an available corpse in what was termed Operation Mincemeat, intended to mislead the Axis powers prior to the Allied invasion of Sicily. Leslie Howard's legitimate loss was announced at the same time, thus granting more credence to Major Martin's story. But this sort of fictionalization of history can be dangerous. Anybody remember uh, Brian Williams? <laughs> oh, yeah. We have all become familiar with alternative facts, innocently applied. Alternative facts are generously distorted personal perceptions and, at worst, intentional deceptions. They are the breeding ground of pseudo-history. George Orwell, the famed author, uh, noted about he who controls the past, and you see the rest of it there. This is, on one level, surely a comment on power, but also an argument on responsibility by those who claim to write in the historical field. For who has more power years removed from an event than a gifted writer claiming some personal association with it? For many historians, crucial differences exist between accurate histories of past events and those malfeasance manuscripts laden with historical inaccuracies. Failure to make those critical distinctions affects our present understanding. As Mark Twain said, when I was younger, I could remember anything, whether it had happened or not, 
but my faculties are decaying now and soon I shall be so that I can not remember any but the things that never happened. <laughs> in a 2002 paper entitled The Function of the Historian in Society, Richard C. Carpenter wrote, as soon as our understanding of the past is divorced from the facts and objectivity fostering methods, all opinions become equal and there will be no benefit from any one history because there will be others that will wash and cancel the effects of the one anyone may favor. As such a scenario develops, pseudo-historians wedded to a false past may become willing to resort to the use of force and intimidation to control the public mind, which is essentially the defining feature of a dark age. Then society will not flourish, but stagnate and devour itself, breaking into divided units set against each other as people rally around the version of a pseudo-history that pleases them most. That version of history brings us here, looking at the cannoneer. Over the years, some have liked it and some not. <coughs> Dr. James Robertson was very direct back in 1977. The most horrible embodiment of those sins is Buell's The Cannoneer Recollections of Service in the Army of the Potomac. He brought out a rather interesting essay in an 11 page article in the October 18, 1956, 1856, 1956 essay. Dr. Milton W. Hamilton observed with a facile pen, a convincing narrative power, which has made his books good reading and popular, and a skill and antidote greatly to be admired in a writer of fiction. Buell has perpetrated myths and inventions to the point where it often requires considerable research to disprove oft-cited episodes. For Cleo, the muse of history, although on occasion a temptress, is a vain and wrathful mistress and will stand only so much deception before turning upon a fraudulent suitor such as Buell. In his essay, Richard Carrier also warned a society gripped by pseudo-history is, vi is the victim of a social psychosis. It will suffer a memory disorder that, as with an individual whose memory is wholly functional, fictional rather, will lead that society to confusion, despair, and self-defeating behavior. That's something to think on, by the way, as we go around smashing our monuments. Yes, Buell was no historian, but he was a great writer. It hardly seems necessary to investigate all the hallucinations of a dreamer for possible fact, or to disprove the tall stories of a convicted prevaricator. Yet some such task is imposed upon the historian as a result of this sheer literary output. That too came from Carpenter's essay. Buell wrote six historical books, supposedly historical books, in his career, not including his serial articles and a short post-war diary from 1867 to 1868. Given the fraudulences in his works discussed above, Dr. Hamilton pledged the point, since destruction of books will not down on truth, should it not be wise to have some of these works branded Cave Mendasum, which means beware of evil. <laughs> but that all seems a rather cataclysmic condemnation to lay at the feet of some one man for the moment. In the singular case of the cannoneer, however, Buell's research such as it was, mostly, stood veteran peer review. Irrespective of the crimson caveat, well, you know he wasn't there, his work yet continues to be referenced. Of course, his first person elements in the text do work strongly against him, and for these deceptions, he should be rightly held to account. In the case of the cannoneer, 
Jules' use and abuse of sources, both primary and diffuse, blessed by an undeniable writer's gift, enabled him to create an unabashedly absorbing tale. We know Buell was not a participant in the major battles he chronicles, neither was he an academic historian. But somewhat, but something, in the essence of the grand story drew him, as I suspected draws us all. His conclusion to the Battle of Gettysburg section in the Cannoneer is as honest a piece of writing as you may encounter. In the future, when all, and this is his writing here, in the future, when all of us shall have passed away and our descendants shall pride themselves on our deeds as we now pride ourselves on the deeds of our revolutionary grandsires, the proudest of all boasts shall be, my grandfather was a soldier at Gettysburg. Does that not get you just right here? By the time Civil War veteran and author Augustus Caesar Buell finally laid down his crooked pen on the 23rd of May, 1904, at the age of 57, he had blazed a trail of falsehoods across several historical areas. Note in that illustration the benighted title, Colonel, dubbed the father of lies by naval researcher Samuel Eliot Morrison, his works remain controversial. For students of the American Civil War, and in particular the Battle of Gettysburg, his initial work, The Cannoneer, will always remain his crowning, much-debated creation. Good evening. <laughs>